welcome Jerry Meek, everybody. Come on, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. 30 seconds here, I'll be all set. So this is, a, this is a prime example of doing something you shouldn't be doing. I was on a job site a couple of weeks ago and I lifted a piece of stone that I thought I could handle well. And I was laying it down, but my hand kept going when my body stopped and it was just like, yeah. Anyway, here we are. I'm gonna log in here and good. Well, I am honored to be here this morning. It is a joy. We feel like we're not visiting. We feel part of your congregation. Yeah. It was so great to be invited back. I was honored. I spent the last day of my 59th year speaking with your leadership class last September, and it was a great way to finish that decade, so I was really excited about that. But we have got such a love and respect and affirmation for your, your two pastors. They have. You know, he says, I do all this for them, but he blesses me. They're on my life team. We are in great fellowship with them. We love seeing them. And more than anything, we believe in them. We believe in what this church is doing. When we see all that you're doing in the community, whether it's water for fires, what you just did for teachers, the basketball court, what he does with the prisons and the, all of that, I just think it's amazing. And that is truly, that's what the church is supposed to be like. So the ones that aren't doing those things aren't truly the New Testament church. They are in the community, they are being salt, they are being light. And I'm thankful for that, and that's what God's given. And I don't want the worship team sad to get too big, but I do think they're awesome, and we love it. So <laughs> we come for the worship, and we do like Landon, but we love the worship. So. <laughs> Lord, I just thank you for this day, Father. Just let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, Father, let them be acceptable to you, Lord. Lord, that you would speak through my words, Father, that you would touch the hearts of the people here today, that they would just, one person would receive one thing, Father, and I will think this day is a success, Father. Lord, just speak through me, your messenger, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So a little bit about our story. Um, I grew up and went to 10 different schools by the time I got to my junior year in high school. I had a season where we went to, I went to two schools my sixth grade year, and I made a terrible transition. I was almost six feet tall, and I was picked on, I was bullied, I was beat up, and it was not fun, and I was all alone, and I know what that feels like. I know what it feels like to live in a trailer. I know what it feels like to be blessed financially, and I know what it feels like to not have anything. But all along the way, it's what God has in store for your life and trusting in him. And what Landon said, it's about the heart, it really is. I had the honor of meeting my wife, Carol, my junior year in high school. We were both in the concert choir together, and no, I am not singing for you today. <laughs> but Carol, I always knew she wasn't somebody I wanted to date, but I know she'd make an amazing wife. So we were really good friends, and we ended up going to Europe together uh, with the International Youth and Music Festival with ASU's choir. We were a high school choir. and I. I was a little full of myself that year because I actually had friends, I made people, I kind of came out of my shell. And Carol was like, I would always go see her when I got dumped by a girl, you know, that kind of a thing. But she was our choir leader's favorite girl, and I was the other guy who wasn't the favorite. So <laughs> Carol, when we went to Europe, had special treatment. I was in the dorms with bunks and a bunch of guys. Carol had a room for her and her three closest friends and a private shower and an ironing board. So because I knew Carol liked me, and I had made a lot of friends from other states, and we were out dancing most of the night before as I remember the story now, I said, Carol, I need a big favor. She goes, sure, I said, I'm gonna be running tight on time. Do you mind if I use your shower? She goes, oh, no problem. And I said, oh, and by the way, do you mind ironing my pants on my shirt for me? And she said, no problem. And I should have been concerned at that point. Yeah. So I got out of the shower, and I was dressed. I grabbed my clothes, and I'm flying. I'm running late. She sure did iron my stuff. She hemmed my pants up 12 inches on both sides. <laughs> she sewed my zipper all the way down, and my shirt sleeves are up to here. Yeah. 
Pride goeth before a fall, and it took me two years to let her do my laundry once we were married. <laughs> no, just kidding. It's been a great journey. Carol and I celebrated 39 years of marriage. Um, so she is my first and my only wife. We have three children. Uh, we have one daughter who's in heaven, and she's laid to rest up here on the Flagstaff Cemetery. This flag's always been a special place to us. And we have two amazing adult, and forgive me if you see this, sons, single young men. <laughs> uh, so in any event, but we are just so blessed to be here. And when Landon asked me to speak on the heart and generosity, I was like, absolutely. I'm not a professional speaker, although I th thank you for the kind words. I'm a working guy. I lift stone. I hurt my hands. I don't sit in an office. I'm a, I'm a construction guy. I always have been and have enjoyed it, and it's been a blessing. But, it, and it's, it's the path God's put me on. But I love speaking about generosity because God has done so many amazing things to us, through us, and for other people to use us as a channel, not a reservoir, but a channel, like you were talking about training people, coming in, going out with what you learn. We've got a friend who has an amazing business. And we, we, we built actually his house, and it was always funny. He goes, yeah, everybody says we were an overnight success. He goes, we went 16 years working seven days a week, and then one day we were an overnight success. Yeah. And I want to speak a little bit on a subject today, but when I turned 60, the day of my birthday, I got a letter from Social Security telling me what my benefits would be when I retire. So I start looking, it's like, oh my God, Carol, we were poor. <laughs> my, our first 10 years of income, average income was $9,071 a year for 10 years. If you averaged our 20 years in business, it was $19,000 a year. Yeah, so it wasn't like, oh, this is an amazing thing. I, we owned a job. We didn't own a business. And God worked through that. Everything I experienced in that time, I learned from, I built upon. And those are all great things. But I guess what I want to talk to you a little bit this morning is about generosity. And when I read a book, I want to know who the author is. Because anybody can have a book. And I don't know if you're familiar who John is in the Bible, but he was one of the early apostles. He was with Jesus in the beginning. And he was also with Jesus at the crucifixion and the resurrection. And John has a great message for all of us. And so I tried to get Landon to give me a taller table. And uh, <laughs> so excuse my uh, awkwardness here momentarily. But John was one of the first disciples. He was actually one of Jesus' favorite. G John was the apostle Jesus loved. And he was a member of his inner circle which was Peter, James, and John. So I'm thinking, this guy's pretty good. But you know what? John's got a pastoral heart. He wanted to strengthen Christians in their faith and their genuine fellowship with Christ and lead them to an eternity with him. And today's message is going to be in three parts, and it will be brief, because I now know how to watch the clock. <laughs> um, it's called The Gate, The Heart, and The Blessing. And at 20 years old, for those of you who maybe are young and don't know that God's got a plan for your life, he can use you at an early age, and he can use you at my age as well and beyond. John wrote this at 20 years old. I am the gate. Anyone who goes through me will be cared for, will freely go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come unless to kill, steal, and destroy. I have come that you may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. Jesus isn't a thief. Jesus didn't come to steal. He didn't come to destroy. Jesus came to give, not to get. And that's how we should be as followers of Christ. We should give. He came that we would have meaningful, purposeful, and an abundant life. The word abundant is hard to explain, but if you go back into the Greek, it's exceedingly more than you could ever think, more than you could ask, more than you could hope, more than you could imagine. And I think that that's something I hope all of you experience someday in your lives, because it is possible. And everything I say today, Carol and I have experienced. This isn't from a book. This is from our lives, and it's real. 
the good and the bad. But what I think about with the gate and the shepherd, we were able to go to Israel a couple of years ago, and it was an amazing pilgrimage to actually see everything in the Bible was true and that we read. But it was talking about a Jewish shepherd, and he was building this pen at night to hold all of his sheep in. And there was no door. It was just the narrow opening. And I thought about those guys laying that stone when I looked at my hand this morning. It was uh, quite interesting. I could see how they might have hurt themselves. But he was talking about as the sun went down and the darkness came, the man said, why isn't there a door? And he says, I am the gate. I lie across that opening. And none of my sheep get out and none of the wolves get in. And that's what Jesus wants to do for our lives. And I want to read this short portion to you. Jesus in that verse I just read was saying, I am the living door. In order to go into the fold, you must go through me. Likewise, to go out to pasture, you must go through me. As the door, I am the protector and I am the provider. When you come in the door, you are not only saved, but you are safe. When you go out through me, you go out to pasture. I am the provider. Nobody is coming through that door except the one who comes through me. In the last part of verse 9, Jesus was saying that the saved go in and out and find pasture, which leads to the claim in verse 10 that they may have life and have it to the full. Christ provides abundant life for his sheep. And what I really like about John is he wrote that verse when he was 20. Fast forward to John in the 80s. He's an octogenarian now. He wrote 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John in that time period. And I love how he looks back and reflects. We proclaim to you which that was from the beginning, that which we have heard, that which we have seen, that which we have looked at, that which we have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. John wrote these letters so our joy may complete. When I say I come here, I feel like a member. We're all part of God's family here. Yeah. And I love the fact that maybe I'm in one city or a different city and you're a different place, but we're all God's family. And if he wrote these words for our joy to be complete, I think we should embrace that. It's available to us. But he continues on. But first, uh, Samuel Johnson wrote a quote and I always thought it was so amazing. People need to be reminded more than they need to be taught. And I'm thinking, gosh, that's really cool. I wish I could write something that good. <laughs> but it was John who wrote it in his 80s, 65 years after he met Jesus. But permit me a reminder, friends, that this is not a new commandment, but simply a repetition of our original and basic charter, that we love each other, Love means following his commandments, and his unifying commandment is that you conduct your lives in love. Yeah. This is the first thing you heard, and nothing has changed. Amen. Those are good words. Yeah. We receive abundant life when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. And my question to you is, are you in a relationship with Jesus Christ? Because until you are, all of the abundance and the heart issues, they're not possible to get right and to get true. And that's the first and foremost thing. In the second section, I said, as God wants your heart, where your treasure is, your heart will also be in Matthew 6, 29. God wants your heart. There is no poor among you because God is going to bless you lavishly in this, in this land that God, your God, is giving you as an inheritance your very own land. When you happen upon someone who's in trouble or needs help among your people with whom you live in this land that God, your God, is giving you, don't look the other way pretending you don't see him. Don't keep a tight grip on your purse. No, look at him, open your purse, lend whatever you have and as much as he needs. Something we adopted in our business years ago we didn't want to just help, we want to be the first to help. Yeah. And it's important when you see something, keep it awareness. I shared with Landon, we spent a couple of days up here in July. We're getting ready to go back down. We're going to fill up the car. There's this white truck over to the side. He's just sitting there. 
nothing's happening. So I wash the windows, top off the tank, and it's like I keep looking at this guy. He's just sitting there. I'm like, okay, this isn't by accident. So I went up and I said, how are you, sir? He goes, oh, not too good. I said, well, what's going on? He goes, well, last night my truck got broken into and they stole all my money. I said, I see the Semper Fi. Is that like you or did you borrow the truck? He goes, no, I served our country. And I said, thank you for your service. And then I said, what can I do for you? He says, I need money to get home in California. Yeah, I could have prayed with him, could have laid hands on him. No, he needed money, so I gave him money. And I think that's the awareness we all need to be. And, I don't, and generosity is more than money. It's your attitude towards helping people. It's prayer. It's leadership. It's a lot of different things that you can do with what you have. You can be generous today by encouraging somebody, by supporting somebody, by reaching out to somebody you haven't talked to in a long time. There's a lot of things you can do to be generous. Don't pour treasure down here where it gets eaten by moths and corroded by rust or worse, stolen by burglars. Stockpile treasure in heaven where it is safe from moth and rust and burglars. It's obvious, isn't it? The place where your treasure is is the place where you will, you will most want to be and end up being. My question is, where do you want to be most? Where's your treasure? Only you can answer that question, but I think it's worthy of your time to consider it. The other thing I want to share, too, is the next story, it's not a formula. It worked in our lives. God is not a vending machine. You can't put a dollar in and get 10 back. If you could, I'd have a couple of those, but I don't. <laughs> so, but I want you to see the principles that we've had. Over a 40-year period in time, through our life, our business, family, health, loss of a child, it took us eight years to pay our, our youngest son off because of it being a preemie at uh, Phoenix Children's Hospital. He was born at two pounds, and it was eight years of payment, starting with 26 doctors. But we continued to pay, we continued to do it, and on his eighth birthday, the celebration was for mom and dad, not him. <laughs> so moving along, but we were at a tough point in our life during that season, and we had no money. We were down. Um, I went 22 months without an income, and we just, Carol and I found somebody, saw somebody in need, and we helped them. We gave our last dollar to that family, and we trusted God. The next week, we got two very large unexpected contracts that just came in the door. It's not a formula, but it's a principle. If you depend on God and if you trust him, he will come through for you. Amen. And in 2008, flash forward, everybody knows about how hard the sand states were hit in the construction industry. We had $27 million in sales evaporate in a 45-day period. So that's pretty much everything. So. We figured, okay, we're not going to participate in this economy. God's got a plan. We're going to work through it. We're going to go after it. We're going to stay faithful. We got through that. 2015, fourth quarter, strong economy now. We had 13 projects coming to the end. I had no work signed. I couldn't get an interview. Everybody that normally calls us wasn't calling us. Other people were getting selected without interviews. And it was a tough season. I'm like, and it wasn't about me. It was all the dozens of families working for us and their kids. That's where the pressure came. And there's a, there's a verse in Daniel that says, God, don't bless me for my sake. It's for you. How are people going to see me as a believer if I don't come through for people? And I think that was the key for that. And God did bless. He came through in a way exceedingly and abundantly. We got more work signed up in the month of December 22nd and 23rd two completely unique and extremely large homes, largest in the country, as I've been told, under construction right now. We got those signed up. If we'd have taken on any other work, we wouldn't have been able to handle both of them. Right. So God knew, and he kept us at bay. And it's like, I just, okay, God, I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you, and it's going to come through. And it did. Amen. And I'm very thankful for that. So God wanted my heart. He's got it. So in Deuteronomy 15, give freely and spontaneously. Don't have a stingy heart. The way you handle matters like this triggers God, your God's blessing in everything you do, all your work and ventures. Let us not become weary of doing good, 
for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. What mom taught me growing up is charity begins at home. I think we need to look inwardly at our church here and our body here before we start looking outwardly. And you can give generosity to people within this congregation. Like I said, it's not always money. It could be hospitality. You could have them over for dinner. It could be something. There's a brother here when I spoke last who gave me this amazing banana bread. I don't know where he's at, but <laughs> it was awesome. So anyway. Um, but doing good refers to what Jesus set up as a way of living, the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do. But you really want it to, have, to convey God's love, his grace, and his generosity. It's not about me. It's about him and how he uses me and how he uses you. I'm going to challenge you, and I'm going to ask God to show you an opportunity to be generous in the next week. I want somebody to come into your path where you can be familiar or unfamiliar with that person, and you are going to be compelled to do something kind. And I'm trusting that God's going to touch you, just one person. I love what Zig Ziglar used to say, you can change the world if you touch one person. That's it, one. And I think you're capable. So I'm praying God's going to surprise you. Remember, and this is part of what Landon said at the offering, God loves it when the giver delights in giving. God can pour on the blessings in astonishing ways so that you're ready for anything and everything, more than just ready to do what needs to be done. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion, and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. And as a reminder, the first point, the gate, Jesus will protect and provide for us the heart where your treasure is. Where do you want it to be? In our third section, and as we pre begin to close, the blessing. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. I think it's important to thank God for what he's given us, but God doesn't bless us all in the same way with the same thing. The sign of a true friend is somebody who can be happy for you when you're doing well, that you can respect somebody and be happy that, man, God's blessed them, that's amazing. We've all grown up in the iPod, iPhone, iTouch, iTunes generation. It's not UPad, YouTube, whatever. What is YouTube? Uh, but to think about it, that God has a blessing for you. And to remember, when God blesses us, the blessing is meant to bless other people, just as it was with Abraham. So what did we do in this down economy? In 2007, before the market crash, we had opportunity to go to the Phoenix Dream Center. Our, our, young, our oldest son had been do working, donating time, using our equipment when it was purchased. He said, hey, Dad, I think they need some kitchen equipment down there. So hey, get some prices. We did the pricing thing. And then I went down there with them. I'm like, oh, they don't need some equipment. They need a whole new kitchen. And when you meet people that are worried about their next meal, you are moved by compassion. We were able to meet with them. We started this amazing kitchen, and then the market tanked. And the pastors came to me, and they said, Jerry, we understand the economy. You don't have to go through and finish this. We'll understand. I thought they wanted to have lunch for an update what's going on. I said, you know, I really appreciate that offer, but I have to turn it down. I'm like, why? So I didn't make the commitment to you. I made it to God. And how would it look to our sons if I didn't keep my word when things got tough? So that was a pivotal point in my walk of faith. And we were able to finish that kitchen. And the reason I want to say that is in 2009, what do you do when you don't know what to do? You do the next thing. And God had always put a scripture on my heart that he learned it when I was in my early 20s. Ephesians 6, 8. What you make happen for others, God will make happen for you. So after being at the Dream Center, and then I was on the foundation board at the time, and I was at the grand opening of Phoenix Children's Hospital. One of our clients invited us, and they had 20 amazing Christmas trees. 
there was a competition, they were gonna be auctioned off. And I was thinking, wow, that's interesting. And I know my strengths, and I'm not like a super creative person. I'm, my creativity comes in the leadership and execution and the leadership architect over big projects. That's my strength. Me getting an idea, I was like, I didn't know if I should say anything. So I talked to Carol, and I said, Carol, I said, this came to me. What if we go to the Dream Center and ask them for 10 rooms, and we'll have 10 interior designers come in and remodel them, and we'll just do the whole thing, and we'll just bless them. And she said, great idea. I'm like, nice, going after this. So in any event, so what did that awareness in an, in an environment that was completely foreign to me and an idea that God put in. Well, right now, being aware of that, we have 10 design firms, 34 trade partners of ours, 300 different companies, 1,000 volunteers, and from start to finish, we completed that entire project in 72 calendar days. It was exceptional. <laughs> But what's more important, as the end of last year, there were 141 babies born from those survivors of human trafficking. There were 593 young women rescued between the ages of 14 and 26. And there were over 5 million meals served out of that kitchen to people in the unit, foster care, all kinds, recovery people. So it was an amazing opportunity, and to this day, it's probably the most rewarding thing that we've ever had a part in in our lives, um, other than my wife and our children. But, but you know where I'm going with this. And this is the last scripture that I want to close with. All the people on earth will see you living under the name of God and hold you in respectful awe. God will lavish you with good things, children from your womb, offspring from your animals, and crops from your land the land that God promised your ancestors that he would give you. God will throw open the doors of his sky vaults and pour rain on your land on schedule and bless the work you take in hand. You will lend to many nations, but you yourself will not have to take out a loan. But generous people plan to do what is generous and stand firm in their generosity. And that's what I'm asking you today is the challenge is Plan on being generous with your time, with your prayers, with your compassion, with your respect, with your love, with your life. Plan on it. Make a choice. It's your choice. Give somebody a, a hug. Smile at them. Encourage them. Have somebody over for dinner. It's up to you. Whatever God's gifted you with, that's what you should use. So in thinking about, instead of thinking about what you can get, think about what you can give. And I had on my heart the last service for the people that were watching in our correctional facilities. I just want you to know that God's gifts come with a full warranty. They never expire. He never revokes them. And yesterday is over. It ended at midnight. And the final chapter in your book has not been written. And I just want to encourage you to stay the course, stay with the Lord. And most importantly, none of this happens without a relationship with Jesus Christ. I thank you very much for this opportunity. And God bless you. Did you know that God wants not to just forgive your sins, but he wants to forgive your debts? Come on, somebody with student loans said a good amen, right? <laughs> you know you want those taken care of, but God can do it. Why, why limit God? Why tell God he can't? See, when Jerry started off, he said part of it's what we, our part that we have to play. And part of that is saying, I'm ready to receive. I'm not going to tell God how he can and can't bless me. I, I'm going to receive from the Lord. And I encourage you, some of you are here today and need to receive Jesus as that gate. Some of us need to check our heart and, and, and ask ourselves, am I generous? I want you to write that down. Would, would you consider yourself generous? And then, are you blessed? And if the answer is yes, oh, praise God every day. Worship God every moment. What a great word. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I want to pray with you. This is your opportunity right now to receive this word for you, not for somebody else, not to get up here and leave and, and think that this is for someone else. This is for you. So with every head bowed and every eye closed here and online and at both of our prisons in Lewis and Maricopa, I want you to close your eyes and I want you to begin to say, God, show me. 
Show me, God. Check my heart. David said, Lord, check on my heart. Make sure I'm okay. Some of you came in with pain and with hurt, but you need to go ahead and surrender it to the Lord and say, Lord, check on my heart. Check and make sure I'm doing okay. I need a heart check today. I want to be generous. I want to live the blessed life. I don't want to live under the curse anymore. And for anyone in here who wants to receive Jesus as your gate and your good shepherd to protect you from all the, 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 the arrows of the enemy that he would try to throw at you, all the attacks of those wolves that would try to come after you, that God can be your gate and your protector and provider if you let him. But you've got to invite him into your life. And if that's you, with every head bowed and every eye closed, we're not thinking about anything else. And if you're a believer, I want you to begin to pray for those who are going to invite Jesus into their life right now. If that's you and you want to invite Jesus into your life, maybe rededicate your life because you've been living it your own way and you finally need to say, okay, God, I'm done playing the stubborn game. I'm done playing the prideful game. I'm done playing the arrogant game, the doubtful game. I don't want to be in that life of roller coaster anymore. I want to give my life to you. If that's you and you want to give your life to the Lord today here and at each of our prisons, I want you to raise your hand right now. Thank you for the hands going up here. Thank you for the hands online. Thank you. You guys pr get ready to pray with each other in each of those prisons and get ready to pray for each other right here because we're, you're not going to pray this prayer alone. In a moment, we're all going to repeat this prayer together. I want you to repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I receive you now as my Lord, as my Savior, as my good shepherd, as my heavenly Father. I'm forever yours, and I am saved. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Let's give God some praise.